I'm Chelsea Lee, CEO of Shipsy, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, I'm John White, author of What You Don't Know About Listening Could Fill a Book, and you're watching Eye on Business. Hi, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. And I want to talk about technology trends and how technology trends affect business, business decisions, and making businesses different. It's like Wayne Gretzky used to say, I skate to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. And the same thing is true about uh, technology. So I want to welcome Raghu Bala, CEO of NetObjects and yes. a technologist by training. Yes. So Thank welcome. You. Thank you for having me. And I'd like to know just a little about yourself. Sure. Um, I'm CEO of NetObjects. We are a uh, technology startup here in Irvine, California. And uh, I've been in the industry for about uh, 27 years and uh, done multiple startups. And uh, this is my fourth one. So with 27 years in the industry, you should have a fairly good perspective on where things had been. But I want to talk about where things are going. Sure. So if we take a look at 2017, what new technology trends were implemented in 2017? So I'd say there are three things that have been uh, making news uh, in this year. Uh, first one is Internet of Things. Okay. The second one uh, would be uh, AI. has made a major comeback. Uh, it was very hot in the 80s, and now uh, companies are finding a lot of users for AI again. And the third, I would say, is blockchain. It's been hitting the, the you know, uh, uh, front page news almost. But there are a lot of business use cases for blockchain beyond Bitcoin and so on. So oh, well, let me just ask the quick question. It's everyone wants to know, did you invest in Bitcoin? Uh, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Neither did I, by the way. Um, so we'll talk about um, those three technologies. Which ones are going to be the real keys as we move into 2018? And are you seeing any other technologies coming to the fore? So uh, going into 2018, I think all these three would still dominate. Uh, but then I'd say the most important of the three might be AI. And uh, AI will utilize the other two uh, in, in, in different ways. So um, other technologies coming up, uh, you know, there are variations of AI itself, like robotics and other things which are uh, becoming popular. But I'll stick with these three uh, as a uh, predominant trends. Okay, now, we look at technology, but they're not implemented across the board in all market segments. Mm -hmm. So let's stay on, techno on AI. Mm -hmm. um, I look at um, uh, AI in med. We just had an AI med conference. Sure. Um, there's AI in um, personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. There's AI in robotics. Mm -hmm. Where do you see the markets that will really adopt AI today, and how does it, what's the relationship between AI and uh, big data and deep learning? Because okay. I think people don't understand those relationships. So, so that's that's a good question. So <clears throat> AI itself, I would break it down to three subcategories. Uh, one is uh, machine learning, second is natural language processing, and the third is robotics. So robotics itself, for example, there are a lot of use cases in manufacturing and so on, and some in medicine. Uh, there's uh, robotic medicine uh, that one can do remotely and so on. Uh, if you look at machine learning, it's got a number of use cases. Uh, for example, in, um, in the retail field, there's a lot of uh, you know, uh, use cases for uh, chatbots. Or if you call up your bank and you want to do uh, you know, some phone inquiry, a lot of times uh, today it's run by chatbots. Um, the uh, second one, natural language processing, if you look at companies like uh, Yahoo, Google, and others, I used to be at Yahoo, and uh, we have been we had been using uh, AI since uh, the mid uh, 2005, six uh, time frame. So how Google, for example, or Yahoo, 
uh, puts up ads on a, on a page is based on reading the page, and a machine reads the page, uh, and then it puts, uh, you know, relevant ads and, uh, and so on. Now, in terms of your second uh, part of your question, which was how does AI relate to deep learning and big data and so right. on. So, if you look at uh, Internet of Things is a good way of uh, data acquisition. So, whichever way you acquire data, lots and lots of data needs to be acquired, first of all. Once it's acquired, it's uh, stored in big data repositories, and then AI is used on top of these reposit repositories to train the machines to learn. So the machine learning is, uh, is based on collecting lots and, lots and lots of data, corpus of data, and then once they, the machines find a pattern in the data, then it can start to do you know, what we call intelligent things, but it's not actually intelligent to the point of it's not able to reason but it's able to follow patterns very well. So. All right, so if you follow patterns, you can probably adapt things in cancer research, mm -hmm. uh, stock trading, yes, and dating. <coughs> dating, uh, <laughs> that might be a, bit, a little bit of a challenge because uh, it's a lot of emotions involved there. Well, as but opposed to stock trading, stock trading, yeah, that might be a little I'll bit of There's there. a lot of emotions in, there in stock too. trading. That's there but, too. but think about this. Let's co incorporate AI with um, something like um, VR. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I can get online. I can take a look if I'm trying to get a date online, like for match or chemistry or whatever. Mm -hmm. And now I can see facial you know, expressions. Right. I can use a variety of data right. and deep learning to determine whether or not that person is true, truthful, honest, and get some characteristics. That's a very good question. In fact, I use a chip that's made by a company called Omron, and um, it, can, uh, it can do sentiment analysis. So <clears throat> it, this chip, we put it on kiosks, and when we put it on kiosks, the, the kiosk is actually looking at you, and it can first of all discern whether it's a male, female, age groups. It's very accurate, it's, uh, unbelievably accurate. But one of the things it also does, it can find out whether you're smiling or you're angry and things like, like that. It's about seven or eight different dimensions. And uh, so some of this technology is actually being used uh, to market movies and other things. Uh, so for example, when people, uh, uh, begin to do these uh, sort of previews of movies before right. they come out. Uh, they actually do some audience profiling yes. and they figure out how the audience is reacting to certain scenes, whether to leave it in the movie, uh, leave it out, uh, and stuff like that. So yeah. By the way, my daughter does that for stars. Oh, cool. Uh, she's director of brand, so she uses some of that technology, but she doesn't want input from dad, you know, it's one of those <laughs> things. Let's, let's sum this up, and I'd like to have you back and talk about other technology trends, but particularly AI and med, because I know you did some work in that at one time, and sure. you, you won a best paper award, if I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes, last year in 2016. Yeah, so that's cool. So we'll come back and we'll talk about that, but can you give the audience uh, a few, two or three ideas on where to look for technology and in what market segments, so that the new street-savvy business executive can keep an eye out and try to implement these new technologies to keep ahead of the competition. Where would you suggest they look and what technologies? So in terms of uh, where they look, I would say uh, I, first of all, uh, read certain types of media uh, like uh, TechCrunch or Mashable and things like that, yep. where they have, uh, they do cover a lot of the uh, cutting edge stuff. So even though it may not be relevant for, uh, to use immediately, you at least have a view towards where it's headed. So I'd say uh, one place to go is uh, media. C certain trade shows as well are a good, uh, especially in the expos and so on. Um, I usually do a lot of walk around, talk to a lot of people to see what's coming up, uh, uh, you know, trend-wise. Right. The third uh, area, which is actually uh, one of the uh, areas that one can really follow technology, is a lot of online courses these days, like Coursera, edX, and so on. So that keeps you really up to date as to what's going on. Um, in academia, which usually there's a kind of a trend where some technologies hit academia first and then they come into the common marketplace. Right. So I tend to look at trends uh, at, at the school level, uh, what's being researched on and what's coming up next. All right, so we have IoT, AI, deep learning, 
and we have the ability to figure out by keeping in touch through trade shows, um, magazines, and online resources mm -hmm. on where these new opportunities lie. Sure. I think that's great advice, and then we can adapt it to the individual market segments. Right. Well, there you have it, folks. We have an understanding of where technology is going in 2018, and as we start the year, this may be a good prelude to what we'll actually see by the end of the year. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Have a good evening. Hi, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. And at the end of 2017, I published a book called Street Savvy Business, A Way to Prevent Corporate Mediocrity. It's based upon these uh, interviews, uh, the TV show, and my consulting practice. It's really down-to-earth, practical, good advice, tools, techniques, and uh, methodologies that could easily be applied to your business, be you a, be you a startup or a small company, a medium-sized company, or even large companies. Uh, it's available on Amazon uh, as a Kindle edition or in a paperback and also on lulu.com. Hope you enjoy it, and if you do, please write a review. Thank you very much. Hi, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. And tonight I want to welcome Scott Hamilton. Scott is the CEO of Executive Next Practice Institute. Welcome, Scott. How are you today? Great to be here, David. Thank you. God, my hand hurts by that <laughs> one. But um, tell us a little about yourself first, and then I want to ask you about Next Practice Institute, what it is. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, yes, I do run the Executive Next Practice Institute. I'm also Managing Director of Next Work Strategy, which is an organization that works with middle to large cap enterprises to help them better craft their strategy and execute. So a little bit about my background. I'm an ex-corporate uh, refugee from Nestle, Aramark, Allied Signal, Bergen, Brunswick, where I ran marketing operations for them, organization effectiveness, and technology. Well, that's great. I can eat my Nestle's Hershey bar or candy bar while I do bowling. You got it. Something like that. Exactly. Okay. So let's talk about next practices. We've known about best practices. But we want to try to help executives figure out what they're going to do different than what the competition is. And by just, you know, picking up the best practices, everyone regresses to the mean. So what is a next practice versus a best practice? Well, let's look at it this way. Uh, everyone tries to reach a level of comfort, a level of comfort, which takes them to the status quo. And then when they try to get past the status quo, they start looking at others and they start trying to benchmark or best practice against other companies. Fair enough. Someone else's business model, someone else's approach to the market, someone else's customer. And when they best practice against another business model, guess what? You, you wind up mediocrity. You wind up also on the wrong playing field. Correct. So the idea behind next practices is take your business model, your strategy, and apply it to your organization, your markets, your customer but look beyond what existing practices are, even within your own company. In other words, push the envelope. So do you take a best practice from one industry and, and maybe apply it to a different industry? Would that be a next practice, or is that just the best practice reapplied? You could do that. If you look at an example, like Blockbuster and how they got disrupted by Netflix, mm -hmm. Netflix took some of the elements of Blockbuster, but did it and applied it in a different way. Look at Uber and how they Uberized the marketplace. They took some elements of the yellow taxi cab, but mostly they started and said, let's go from point A to point B in the most elegant and most efficient way, and came up with the Uber app. Uh, Uber app. So how does one think? I mean, who are the people that come up with next practices? And then the, the second part, which we'll explore, is how do the executives adapt to these next practices? Because there's a higher risk risk of failure, risk of not doing it right, risk of not having the right people in place. So how do, how do you come up with these next practices? And here's the thing. It's not you specifically, but the-, the Yeah, the exactly. Day. We work with thousands of companies. Here's the thing. The larger you get as an organization, the larger you get, 
the more myopic you get. Correct. The more short-sighted you get, right? You start to look inside of yourself. You start putting practices and standards inside. You start building monuments to yourself, large corporate headquarters, uh, and you start to lose sight of your business model, your customers, and your value proposition. Okay. So the next practices often are found outside your organization, outside your industry, in perhaps adjacent industries, or someone that is behind you that you don't see. So that's what we're looking for. Someone that's coming from our blind spot, can we find it? Can we look, seek it out and apply those practices to our organization? It's right. quite a challenge. So one of the things we used to do in new product development is look at what the, a concept called um, lead users. Eric Von Hippel at MIT came up with this concept yeah. where you look at somebody who is developing things ahead of the curve. Those are, quote, the innovators on that S-curve. Are you trying to find those innovators that have these next practices? And how do you find them? Yeah, we're looking for those folks that uh, are really shaking up their own industry and certainly trying new things and trying new technology. But here's the thing. We also have the intelligence inside our own organizations. We're just not tapping it. On average, only 5%, only 5% of the intelligence of your whole organization is being tapped for new ideas and new innovations. Often, it's the eight people in the executive suite running the business, and that's the only people we talk to. And yet, you've got 800 people working with you that can come up with unique ideas. Yeah, so if, if you have only eight people, they have two things. Number one, myopia. They're exactly. insular. Exactly. And they're risk-averse normally in larger companies. Yes. So what about this? just a really strange concept, finding those, finding those people in the organization that are really smart, but always on the edge of basically saying, God, that guy, that guy David is crazy. He comes up with the most cockamamie ideas. Should I get a group of these people, put them on a separate board, report to a specific executive? How does one use these people in the organization? Well, you're getting into one technique that we're prescribing for a lot of organizations, and that is to promote the concept of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. Fair enough. Where we're creating teams within our organizations, often cross-functional, to your point, often contrarians in our organization that will go off and start attacking our own business model. Fred Thiel, former chairman of Local.com, who you and I uh, know, right. chartered his own team within his own, own organization, chartered them to come in every morning, go off in a conference room, and try to, try to disrupt his business, try to destroy his business model. That's out there. That's pushing the envelope and giving people the risk and the risk capital to challenge your business model. That's another facet to it. All right, so let's take a quick look at a next practice that has been implemented in 2017 and will be migrating into new industries in 2018. And then we'll, then we'll wrap it up for today. Sure. Well, when we look at, uh, I'll give you one example, because I just had lunch with the CEO of a company that is uh, attacking the automobile industry, uh, the okay. retail side of it. Oh, okay. As Jeff Bezos of Amazon says, look for an industry that's not changing and go after it. And that's what this individual is doing. He's based in New York. I can't reveal the company's name. But within six months, he's going to disrupt the entire retail automobile industry. Well, what's the next practice? Is he using a, 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 um, uh, an iPad to do something different at the, at the retail point of sale? Or is he just basically saying we're shutting down all retail stores? I wish it was that simple, but he's taking the existing applications, existing structures, existing processes, and using technology to streamline the process and removing barriers, removing extra cost out of the system that faces. For example, when you buy a wholesale car, he's removing a lot of those costs. He's removing the cost of transportation via more efficiencies. Okay. So by this, he's going to make the cost of purchasing a car a full 35% less and it still applies to the retailer. The retailer doesn't go out of business. It just makes his business much more efficient by a 35% margin. All right. So let's give three pieces of advice to a street-savvy business executive that wants to implement something different so they don't regress to the mean. What would be those three guideposts? Here's number one. Uh, sit down with your team. Uh, pull together a strategy where... You can look at your culture, make sure you've made it a culture where people are allowed to innovate, share ideas, take risk. Well, Number two, take them through a process. Four basic questions that they want to ask themselves. The, the blue ocean questions, that is, 
What do they want to eliminate, stop doing? What do they want to reduce that can take out cost, resources, and time? What do they want to create? What do they want to create throughout the organization? And then what do they want to disrupt? Four basic questions that they ask themselves within the organization. Well, that's a good way uh, for the business executive to think about how to implement these, these next practices. And I think it's, uh, it's valid. So as we move into 2018, I think it's a good challenge for the executives to try to come up with these new ideas so they don't regress to mediocrity, so they can stand out and they can grow. Well, Scott, I welcome you um, on the show. Uh, I'd like to have you back and actually talk about some of these next practices and give real concrete examples. Would you be willing to do that? Absolutely. Look forward to it. Look forward to it as well. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. Hope you enjoyed tonight's episode.